We are back with another live devotion here. Um, I was going to say from First Friends Church, but clearly we are still here in my house here in the study. Um, but we are coming to you through the First Friends Church digital presence in the world. And uh, it is great to be with you. Uh, I do want to say right off the top, though, that I'm excited to see all of you again soon in our building. Um, in case you have not heard, we are uh, resuming in-person worship starting on Sunday, June 14th. And so we are looking forward to seeing you there if you are ready. We know that some of you are not quite ready for that because you are still in um, some of those demographics that are considered at the highest risk for the COVID-19 virus. So, But for those of you who are ready, uh, we are excited to welcome you back on Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m., one service in the gym, um, and it is going to be a good time. Um, we have lots of precautions that we're taking. We are going to prop open all the doors. We are going to have hand sanitizer. We're going to space out the chairs. So we're taking the precautions that we can take, and we invite you, uh, if you're ready, to come on back and join us on Sunday morning at 10.30 for some worship and a message. Um, we are not yet opening up any of our kids ministry or our adult small groups because that would be uh, people in more confined spaces together. So that'll be in the future. But for now, we're just excited to uh, think about getting back together in the same physical location. We are making all kinds of adjustments in the gym to try and make that a smooth transition for those of you who join us in person and for those of you who continue to watch online because we are going to offer that uh, same time as it has been, 1030 a.m. You will see everything that's happening in the gym as it happens and you will see it on your screen if you choose to or need to continue continue to worship from home. So um, as we continue to wait for folks to uh, arrive for the live version of this, um, whoa, um, do a little song. This has been our tradition, so we're going to keep it alive. This is an oldie but a goodie flashback. This song was written in the year 2000. It came out in an album uh, written by Paul Beloche, and if you're unfamiliar with him, I can almost guarantee that you're familiar with one or two of his songs because they are immensely popular in Christian circles, including this one. Um, Andy and I joke all the time that there are really two St. Pauls. There is St. Paul the Apostle, obviously, and then there is St. Paul Beloche because he is such a gifted songwriter who has blessed the church, and this is one of the songs that he wrote. Uh, and fun fact, I'm not even sure if Andy knows this. He probably does. He knows most everything about St. Paul. But even Randy Travis covered this song in 2003. So it's called Open the Eyes of My Heart.
St. Paul Beloche, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for that song. Also, if you want to hear the the crooner version of that song, check out the Randy Travis cover if you're a country fan. So, oh yeah, Joe, 2000, that's an oldie for me. 2000 was the year that I got married. Fun fact, um, uh, side note, so I guess this is sort of an early um, happy anniversary, but my wife and I are celebrating 20 years of marriage tomorrow, June 10th, 2000. We tied the knot, as they say. So um, happy anniversary to my beautiful, lovely wife. A day early, I'm sure I'll tell you the same thing uh, again tomorrow. So um, so yeah, Joe, 2000, that's, that's a ways back for me. Um, it is great to see some of your names popping up here, joining us. As always, if you have any questions or comments as we are powering through this devotion, just go ahead and post them there, and I will sneak a peek every now and then, but I will also look at the end to see if there's anything you guys um, are hankering to know any more deeply. So today, back to the book we've been using, uh, What Did Jesus Ask? A short devotional book. Um, not a short book, a book of short devotions, only uh, typically three or four pages long. And today, the devotional in this book, uh, it's a variety of authors. Today, we're looking at the one um, from Joel Houston. Uh, and you may not think you know his name, but sort of in the theme of the day, he is a songwriter for many, many songs that you probably have heard and know and, and sing along with regularly. Um, Hillsong United is uh, the band that he is a part of, and they just have a crazy number of worship songs that are extremely popular. So um, I'm actually going to just read this devotion in its entirety today, and I'll pause here and there with my own interjections and reflections and thoughts. Um, but it's just so good. It's one of the first ones I've read through and just thought, that whole thing is good. And I shouldn't be surprised Joel Houston is uh, a man who just does words well, and I shouldn't be surprised that he does a devotion like this well. So, But we're going to be looking at um, Mark chapter 2. There's a story where Jesus is preaching to a standing room only crowd, and then something unexpected comes down from above. And the question you will hear in the passage we're going to read, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So for the full context of the question, let's look at Mark chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where they were staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, and so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So, I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. The man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers, and they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. So like I said, I'm just going to read through this devotional and pause at certain places to add my own thoughts, but the whole thing is just so good. Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician and philosopher who died in 1662, said this, Man's sensitivity to small things and his insensitivity to the most important things are surely evidences of a strange disorder. An English theologian, G.K. Chesterton, observed nearly three centuries later that big things sometimes have a better way of hiding themselves than small things, and he used the shape of the earth to illustrate his point. For years we thought the earth was flat, but its true form was hidden by both its size and ours. Perhaps most of us would agree with Pascal and Chesterton in that there exists in our world a strange order that both the size of great things and confusion about what is great prohibit us from living life in a sort of spiritual 
awareness. So I'm gonna pause there for a moment and talk about um, growing up as a uh, an early teen, a junior higher, in the very, very uh, early part of the 1990s and coming into uh, my own as a fan of sports in general and, and football in particular. I have this very vivid memory of becoming a huge, huge, gigantic fan of Barry Sanders, the running back for the Detroit Lions. That dude, I mean, I, I would make the argument probably one of easily one of the top running backs ever. I mean, Jim Brown probably the best. I actually think if Barry Sanders had Emmett Smith's off, Emmett Smith's offensive line, he could have run for four thousand yards a year. He was just incredible. But I remember reading a Sports Illustrated article and seeing a picture of Barry Sanders at his locker, and he just had these letters taped like on a sticker. It just said D S T S S, and they asked him what it meant, and he said, "Don't sweat the small stuff." And I think that's part of the challenge we read about in this devotional is understanding the difference between the big stuff and the small stuff and how sometimes we get confused about which is which and what we need to do is choose our focus well and maintain our focus well. So back to the devotional. Um, Joel Houston says, I I often find I'm a victim uh, to this backwardness of our culture when an NBA trade catches my attention and rouses emotions that I pass quickly over the smaller headline of something like a genocide in the Sudan. The sin of the world is a very large, almost obvious thing, but very distant at times. Our own sin is very close, but seemingly manageable, and not as dark as the distant, more depraved sin of someone beheading their enemy online or a murdering militant. Perhaps it takes personal disaster or disability to come to terms with the real problem of brokenness in the world. When we have a friend who is going through torment, we begin to peek our heads out of our intentional distraction and come to terms with the plight of the human situation. So I want to pause here and say just a little... Uh, shameless plug. This coming Sunday, we're getting back together in person. We're going to start a new sermon series, and we're going to examine some of these big questions within Christianity. Questions that we as Christians ask, uh, and questions that I think we are asked by the world around us, because I would argue that in times of of, um, of worldwide um, situations like COVID has been, people tend to do a lot of reflecting on some of those bigger questions. So we're going to talk about those bigger questions and how Christianity answers them and deals with them. It's precisely within this context that Jesus asked questions 2,000 years ago to a crowded house full of the sick and the sinful who were surrounded by saints and skeptics. What is easier, to forgive this man his sins or to heal him? If I were in that room, Joel Houston writes, I'd be wondering, how can we even measure forgiveness to begin with? How do we know someone's been forgiven? How can that claim ever be substantiated? It's not like we can hold the human soul up to a blue light and check it for stains. Is there an x-ray machine that can detect the legal standing of a spirit? In my mind, seeing a known paralytic man be physically healed would be much more impressive because it could be observed and measured. It would fall under the certainty of the scientific method, healing on demand on command. I like that idea, that the idea, how do we measure or prove our status as forgiven people? Um, this Friday, I am finally taking my car in for an oil change. It is time. It's well past time. I think it was due for an oil change uh, April 7th, which obviously is right in the middle of it. Everything started to shut down. And so I delayed and I delayed and I delayed. I'm finally going this Friday to get the maintenance done that my car says that it needs. And I got to tell you, a big reason I'm doing it is not just because it's the right thing, but because every time I turn my car on, there is this message and a beeping, and it just says, uh, vehicle service overdue, and it just stays there until I back out of it. It started out about a month or so ago with a vehicle service suggested, and it would go away on its own if I just waited, but now it's just constantly. So now why do I trust uh, that proclamation from my vehicle that it needs service? Because Um, I'm basing that on um, measurements. It's measuring the things in my car. Even if it's just the time between service appointments, it's measuring things to know. There's a certain timing. There's best practice that goes into this, right? We love things we can measure, that we can um, get our hands on, we can see with our eyes. And so um, it's interesting, Joel talks about this idea of, of measuring or understanding 
or substantiating our forgiveness. Forgiveness is essentially, uh, it's more in the realm of faith than measurement. I can't measure your forgiveness. You can't measure mine. I can't measure my own. But the gift of faith is this this knowledge, this belief, this being convinced, as George Fox would say, um, in the forgiveness that we experience in Christ. Carrying on. This type of proposition Jesus puts forward is an argument in logic called a fortiori, I think that's how that's pronounced in Latin, which means in Latin, with stronger reason. It goes like this, if I can lift this table, then obviously I can lift this banana. The weightier thing in the eyes, in their eyes, was to heal the man. And after his question, Jesus healed the man to prove his authority to forgive sins. The healing ultimately posed another question to everyone in the room. What do you do with the hard evidence? If Jesus heals this man, what conclusions do I draw when presented with this irrefutable evidence? Miracles, even the miracles of Jesus, are still much debated topic within Christianity. I find it very difficult to separate Jesus from his miracles because of stories like this. Jesus used miracles to demonstrate his power over nature, over demons, over sickness and death, and that much heavier yet intangible human condition, sin. But... We are faced with another dilemma regarding miracles, and it's this. Miracles don't equate with biblical faith. Some may ask, if God is God, why does he take such great care in hiding himself? James, Jesus' younger brother, wrote that even the demons believe and tremble. So on one side, there exist those who are not satisfied with God's lack of visibility, and on the other side, those who are fully aware of God's existence, power, and ability, and still yet refuse to trust him. So, then it's possible to see God or miracles and not have saving faith? Absolutely. Hebrews 3 reminds us that the children of Israel, who saw the ten plagues of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, and many other miracles, died in unbelief. And I want to read that passage, Hebrews 3, um, verses 7 through 14. As the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. And so I declared an oath in my anger, they never shall enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I love that phrase, hardened by sin's deceitfulness. When we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Going on, Joel Houston says, How can people see miracles and know that God exists and yet still harden their hearts towards him? Because the journey of humanity towards God is not a journey of the eyes, but rather of the heart. The eyes of the paralytic's friends saw a long journey carrying a stretcher, saw a friend unable to believe for himself, saw a crowded room, a crowded house with no room for them, and a perfectly good roof that should not be damaged. But what did their hearts see? Their hearts had decided who Jesus was, and they would do anything to get their friend to him that day. So you probably guessed now, I decided to do Open the Eyes of My Heart because obviously it's a great tie-in with this point and that the journey toward God and with God is a journey of the heart. I mean, yes, there's great things of beauty and miraculous things we can see and hear and experience, and they're wonderful. But ultimately, those things are, are designed to draw our hearts toward God as well. I'm reminded again of Jesus' great humility in the story. Unafraid of the skeptic or the religious elite, he answers their their questions and heals a man in the middle of their active unbelief. For all we know, the paralytic may have been the one with the most unbelief. Maybe that was his sin. But we know from Mark's gospel that it was the faith of the paralytic's friends in Jesus that healed him. Many people are often put off by Jesus because they have their doubts. Jesus doesn't seem limited by anyone's doubts in this story. If anything, he works miracles 
in the shade of doubts. And I love that part too. You can see why I wanted to read this whole thing. It's all so good. But I want to just make a point that I've made, I don't know how many times, and I'll do it again. Matthew chapter 28, before Jesus gives that great commission, as we call it today, to go into the world and to make disciples, we're told this in, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, just before that commissioning, the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him but some doubted. Jesus did not dismiss the doubters before he gave the proclamation to go and make disciples. There were people who were doubting and in close proximity to Jesus. And I guess I just want to close today by saying, and it's a theme I hit on in a sermon not too long ago, and it's really dear to my heart because I think we live in a culture and a world today where Christianity sometimes gets blamed for casting doubters aside, and I think that in the past we've done that. We've tried to push doubt away to, to make people feel they need to hide it, but you don't see that in any of these stories in the Gospels. Um, so I want to encourage you with these words. Don't let your struggle with doubts make you feel distant from God or disqualified from serving as his witness in the world. Um, we need to be both at about the work of forgiveness and healing. That's really what one of the takeaways from this story is. Jesus both was present for forgiveness and healing. And sometimes we can try and do one without the other or emphasize one too much over the other. Like this world desperately needs forgiveness desperately needs forgiveness. But if we only focus on that cosmic forgiveness that God offers and we don't take care to, to bring healing in the capacity that we can, then we don't do the whole work of Christ. If we only do the work of trying to bring healing to the people and the systems around us and we ignore the need for forgiveness that's there, we only do half of the work that Christ called us to do. So I encourage you today, um, be an advocate for both healing and forgiveness. So uh, let me check these messages over here. Oh, thanks, Jay, uh, for the early happy anniversary. And you as well, Joe, appreciate that. Hi, Lois. Great to see you following along with us today. Um, and I see several of our names that, that have popped up, maybe in and out. I'm not sure if you're all still watching. Um, but uh, thank you for the anniversary love. Um, we're going to celebrate tomorrow. And it's going to be a great 20 years. Uh, it's been a great 20 years, and it's going to be uh, hopefully another long stretch on top of that. So I'll be coming to some of you guys for some some advice on how to continue to live in that happy married state. And then my wife is peeking in. She heard me talking about anniversary stuff so um don't tell her what i told you guys about the thing there's not really a thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right that's enough for today it's great to see all of you and uh hope to see you back again next time